Well, that just dropped right into camera mode instantaneously. <laughs> I expected it to ask me to log in. Let me open up a window here. Get myself over on YouTube so I can see you guys. <laughs> Instantaneously. And make sure my sound is off. Hello, Stephen Smith. And we have sound. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Okay, so we have some things going on today. Number one, we have some moderators that are going to help keep the group smoothly flowing. And I'm excited about that because sometimes it's hard for me to carry the conversation and turn around and watch for trolls. <laughs> pests! Our topic today is pests. That's perfect. We're going to talk about trolls. All right. I had to make a fresh pot of coffee for this presentation. Okay, so uh, we are using some different software. I need to hide this somewhere. This is terrible. Let me see if I can pop this out. That would make my happier. Make me happy. Pop out chat. Because I really don't need to see myself in this. Uh, I don't know. I don't think I do. I'm going to hide that. Where did my chat go? <laughs> here it is. All right, give me one second. Try and get myself super organized here. I think we'll do this. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, we are now two minutes in. I've already wasted two minutes of your life. I apologize for that. Today's topic is about pests in the aquarium. And one of the things that has to be considered is, is it really a pest or is it more like a nuisance? Is it something that you need to fear or is it something that you need to jump in and handle immediately? Or is it something that will take care of itself? Also, what is the best course of action when it comes to solving it? Is it adding a fish that will eat it? Is it adding a chemical that will kill it? Is it going to be some kind of manual effort like siphoning it out? These are some of the things that we can talk about today. And hopefully we can come up with a good game work plan that you will like and, and you can adopt and you can employ. And for some people it's always difficult because of the size of their aquarium. Maybe they have a very tiny tank and they can't, or the tank's very filled with corals, or the tank is so big that the job becomes daunting and they worry about that. So what I am hoping to do here is convey my thought process on how I handle things, and then you can decide what works best for you. So first of all, what I want to do, shrink that down just a little bit, I'm hoping that the moderators will see your questions and then bring them to my attention. I think the easiest way will be to tag me when you're trying to show me a question. We talked about some other stuff that I didn't set up in advance. <laughs> so I apologize for that. Uh, we seem to have on my screen this little thing with my name. I'm going to go ahead and hide that for now. So we can turn that off. So it doesn't bug you to death. And um, what I've done to start us off is I've pulled up the section of my website that deals with pests specifically in the critter ID section. And for example, this one here may be a common one for you to deal with, and that would be nudibranchs that eat zoanthids. And we don't want them, obviously, and how do you know if they're even in your tank? The best way is to take a turkey baster and to blow off the coral, and the zoanthids will close. Well, a nudibranch can't close up. It is going to be completely open the entire time. All they can do is crawl out of sight as quickly as possible. And if you were to see it, your best bet would be to take some tweezers and to pluck it out of your tank. Now, why do they blend in? That thing's brown. It's got a hint of green. Why would that even matter? Well, as they eat the zoanthid in your tank, they actually take on the coloration of the zoa that they consumed. So if you have these bright orange zoas, you may discover you have a creature that looks like a zoa, but once you close them all down with the turkey baster flow, all of a sudden you've got this bright orange thing that's crawling across the closed polyps, and you're like, aha, I found a nudibranch. If you're trying to remove them, uh, you know, like, you find one. So then, of course, if you see one, you fear, oh my god, there must be hundreds. 
That may not be the case. You may only have a few. Or you may have a whole bunch, and you're going to have to start watching for them and systematically remove them as you discover them. But the tweezers is your best bet. One thing I do not want you to do is if you happen to see one crawling on the glass, don't try and squish it with your finger. <laughs> there was a story I've shared this in my pest presentation when giving this talk publicly, is that a guy was working in an office environment and he had a nano tank set up on his desk and he reached in to squish it while he was taking a phone call and whatever was in the creature got into his bloodstream, you know, got in through his skin, his nail bed. I'm not sure what exactly happened. They had to call the paramedics and they had to rush him to the hospital. So don't use your body to squish something. I know that's our instant inclination is kill it, kill it with our, our fist, but let's not do that. Try not to handle things in your tank that you shouldn't be touching. And if you find something weird, I want you to go ahead and I want you to get away from it, uh, you know, but use something safe to remove it. You can use gloves, you can siphon it out, but really tweezers is the easiest bet. This one here is another one, and this is kind of a funny story. I saw this at the fish store on the glass, like, that's awesome. So I took a picture of it, but I need to put my hand behind it so you could see it, otherwise it would focus on the background. And I have some more pictures of it here. It turns out that this guy here actually eats green star polyps, or in this case, probably pink star polyps, because it's pink in coloration. So at the time, I thought this was fascinating. The LFS owner had no idea that was even in his tank. You know, I like to go wander through his store, look in the tanks and see what's new, what's interesting, what's different. And then, you know, if I see something, I'm like, hey, did you know you have this? And I let them know. But at the same time, I always get a picture. <laughs> because a picture is always the best way to prove something you've discovered and to share it with others and help them. By the way, last night I uploaded a video about how to edit your pictures in Lightroom. I'm hoping you got a chance to watch it, and I hope that it's something that you said, oh, yeah, I could totally do that. Because it's really not a difficult process, and to clean up your pictures is always a great way before sharing them. The last few days, I've had people send me pictures of stuff that is so blue. And I'm like, man, if you could just pull the blue out, that would be awesome. So I could actually see what you're showing me. And being able to clean things up inside your, uh, your Lightroom or Photoshop or um, Snapseed. I mean, <laughs> we can go all the way back to old software that Windows used, like Paint. And, you know, kind of go in there and clean up your pictures a little bit. But a lot of the times you can edit your pictures that you're taking with your phone right on your phone in the built-in editor. And you can do a pretty decent job. Another thing you can do is, you know, use the, uh, the clip that I always talk about because I feel like that's an important one. You know, stick it on your camera and that way you can take pictures of anything and we can all see it. So I do recommend that. That's the Coral Lens Viewer. I do sell it on my website, which lets me do this. Go to MilosReef.com and go buy one. <laughs> All right, uh, let me uh, jump off of this critter to a different one. I want to talk about flatworms, and I want to talk about red planaria. Because red planaria, now here's a large picture of what they look like. Nah, it's not the, I'm not in love with this picture. Let's go to a different one. Let's go to the actual link. So red planaria are a pest um, flatworm that occurs in our tank. They look like spots of rust. And then as you are walking... Where are all my pictures? Ah! Obviously, I need to edit that. Bummer. Anyway, um, I will find that and I will fix that later. Replanaria are a flatworm that has three points on the tip. And when you're looking at the, the flatworm, it has a, it, the tail is like a point and a point and a point. And that right there is how you identify them from other flatworms. They're just basically an oval shape. And they are pr prolific. They will spread into your tank, and they're just ugly. They don't really cause great harm unless they were to all die at once. If that were the case, that would be a big concern, and I would be worried for you. And I would warn you that you need to go ahead and, you know, siphon them out. But just because you discovered them in your tank doesn't mean your tank's in trouble. But it does kind of ruin the mood of the exhibit, because you want your tank to be beautiful, and you want it to be pest-free. And so... In the case of this, what I've recommended in the past was to go ahead and siphon out all that you can. Now what I did here was I just took some airline tubing and I took some rigid tubing and I took a small bag, uh, like a mesh bag, and I just tied it off and I actually dropped the bag in my sump. But you know, you can just have this drain right into a bucket next to your aquarium because airline tubing takes out so little water that you could spend 20 minutes siphoning out flatworms out of your tank 
and maybe remove, you know, half a gallon to one gallon of water the entire time, it's a very slow trickle. The biggest problem you'll run into is if you get near the substrate, you might suck in some sand grains and they clog up the tubing and you have to kind of like pinch the tubing and shake it off or tap it or unpoke, you know, clear the tube so it can siphon again. And you want to siphon these flatworms out. If the flatworms um, are, are uh, I should say, activated, if they realize what you're up to, they can basically commit suicide. <laughs> and I know I'm attributing a lot of thought to this, but it's because I dealt with them a lot, you know, many years ago. But if you can siphon them out quietly, basically sneak up on one and shoo, goes right out of the system, that's perfect. If you are stabbing at them and you are poking in that, they can release this reddish orangish liquid into the water and that can be problematic it can actually affect some of your, you'll see some of your corals close up especially the lps corals now let's say you want to treat the tank medically with something like flatworm exit which is a product by salifert and uh, there's other products on the market these days that you can use to remove flatworms but that's the one i used it was a small eyedropper bottle and you would just put in a fixed amount of drops in your aquarium originally the idea was to take the product and just use it as directed. But then we discovered that some of these flatworms are really, um, I'd say not immune, but their tolerance is much higher than expected. So what you can do is take a few flatworms and put them in a gallon of water and then take the product and put in one, two, three, four drops, whatever, and stir it up and see if the flatworms respond. If they don't, put in another drop, put in another drop until you see them actually shrivel up. And that tells you how many drops per gallon you're going to need in your aquarium. The other thing that you have to do is you have to go ahead and you have to siphon out as many as you can before you ever treat. And my whole article here talks about that. You want to siphon out hundreds and hundreds of flatworms. And the first couple of days you do this, you will see so many. And you'll siphon them all out. And the next day you'll look at your tank and it looks like you didn't do a thing. You have just as many. It's like the second wave just came right back out into the open and are in full view again and siphon those out and keep doing this and do it every single day spend you know, a week or two just every single day spending about 30 minutes siphoning out flatworms until you've reduced their population by 90 percent then you can treat your tank with flatworm exit and what you would do is you turn off your skimmer and you turn off carbon and keep the flow going and put the solution in the tank and you'll immediately see the flatworm starting to die They'll actually, it's the weirdest thing, they do like a string that comes off of them, and you'll see them hanging off there like, like kites on a single string. And you can siphon those out. So you put the medicine in the water, the flatworms start dying, start siphoning, don't wait. And within 15 minutes, do a big water change on the tank and run fresh carbon in a reactor. Don't just put a bag of carbon in your, in your tank and hope that'll work. That's not going to do it. You need to actively run carbon because the flatworms that died in your tank are releasing ammonia into the water and that can affect the fish and corals. And so we want to do, you have to be very systematic. Siphon out all you can for two weeks. Make your water change water ready. Um, have a reactor filled with carbon ready, already installed. And then you'll turn off the uh, skimmer and you will, you're not running the carbon yet. You just installed it. You got it ready. And go ahead and treat your tank, siphon out all you can while they're dying. After 15 minutes of doing that, do the water change, turn on the carbon, and pray. <laughs> and if you did everything right, if you followed the directions I'm giving you here, it should be okay, and your tank will be flatworm, flatworm free. If you see more in a week or so, you could treat again. Uh, the best bet, of course, would be to do this three weeks in a row. But the first week will be the most exciting one and the most nerve-wracking. And then when you're done, you'll be super happy. If you turn around and uh, just ignore it and let them grow out of control, well, you know, you may regret it. There was a guy in my club who had zinnia in, in his refugium instead of plants. And he loved it because he said it controlled nitrate. And he went ahead and he, you know, just was happy with those. And he knew he had flatworms, but he didn't care about those because they didn't bother him. What ended up happening was the the magnet inside the protein skimmer split open. And when it did, it, you know, the magnet rusted, released all its crap into the water quietly. You know, it's not like you just see an explosion in the sump. It's just the skimmer maybe not even making a difference in sound. It might still be skimming, but could be spinning. Bottom line is, the magnet split open. It releases crap in the water, and all the zinnia started dying. 
And when all the zinnia started dying, all the flatworms started dying. And when all the flatworms started dying, everything was dying. And the guy lost his entire tank. It was literally the epitome of a crash. And it all started with a bad magnet, but he had, you know, the perfect condition set up to where things could go wrong. Now, remember, he had a, a refugium filled with zinnia, and he had a bunch of flatworms. If you don't have either of those and a magnet splits, I don't want you to be fearful and think, oh, my God, magnets are going to kill my tank, because our tanks are filled with magnets. We have them in our frag racks. We have them in our cleaning magnets. Uh, we might have them in a... Uh, a flipper magnifying glass. <laughs> there was a thing called the porthole that we used to use that came out about six, seven years ago, which was this big thing with like teeth cogs on it. And the, uh, the inside was a magnet and those things would split open and rust. Uh, the return pump can do it. The flow pumps can do it. Uh, and just anything that uses a magnetic uh, drive in salt water, at some point the magnet can and will fail. And when it does, it can affect your tank. So when you see weird things going in your tank, I always tell people, check every magnet you own. Check every single pump you own and try to find the source. All right, enough about that. I want to talk about this guy here. Uh, this was on Reef Addicts. This is my other website that I set up back in 2010, and I've been kind of ignoring it. So this one here, hmm. why is it doing that? Well, let's see if I can get this to activate. Use once, all right. Ah, oh, come on, really? Okay, so these are some orange worms that I discovered inside my 280-gallon reef. And what happened was, I actually am seeing the chat, I'm just not reading it because I'm kind of dealing with the uh, conversation. The orange worm is actually a predator, and... Its name is Onemi Fulgida, and this guy here exudes a slime that he uses to um, to paralyze its prey. And the, the, the prey could be a, a fish, but specifically, typically it's snails. And it will make that item quit moving, and then it will consume it until it's an empty shell. So I found this thing in my tank purely by accident because I installed or I put in a bunch of jars in my tank filled with snails. And that's why I add snails to my tank because it's super easy. If you buy a bunch of snails and you want to put them in your tank, normally what we do is we put one uh, snail on the glass and we let it sit there for a while and it holds and then we get the next snail, we hold on the glass and we wait and it finally grabs on and we take a third one. They're all timid and you finally get it to hold on the glass. Well, that's fine if you bought five snails, but if you bought a hundred snails like I do, I cannot sit there and wait a hundred minutes to add a hundred snails. So instead, I take jelly jars, I fill them up with snails, and I put the jars systematically in my reef in certain locations, and then they pretty much stay in there until lights go out, and then they all bubble out of the glass, and they crawl out, and they go all over the reef, and it's fantastic, and they start cleaning everything in sight. Well, I discovered one of these orange worms inside my tank because it had reached out from the rock and was reaching all the way down into the jar to where there was a few snails left behind and that's how I discovered this thing and when I hit it with a flash I was like what the heck is that it of course retracted instantly like a lightning bolt and I was like oh okay that's a new one and so I had to catch it it wasn't very easy to catch and I had to avoid using light because the light would bring them to your attention and I thought well, how am I going to how am I going to uh, see this thing to catch it? You're working from above. You've got these long tweezers. You're trying to do this, and if you put light, it's going to retract. And what it would do is it would, like, put out, like I said, it had this gel, and it would the gel would be sitting across the sand bed, kind of rolling like a tube, and you know, it'd be inside it. And as soon as you try to grab it, it would retract super fast. I feel like that gel is almost like a lubricant, too, because it can move so quickly away. And when you try to grab it with the tweezers, what happens is, the, the tweezers grab a couple of grains of sand and the worm slips right through the top and retracts. So it took me a while to catch them. And I spent time catching one after another. And I, I had to do it after lights out. But this one's a really important one. You definitely don't want it in your tank. And you have to look for it. And the only way you're going to see it is to investigate your tank late at night with a flashlight. And it's going to look bright orange under your light. So keep your eyes open for this guy. And the full article is on Reef Addicts. I will definitely put a link to this in my, uh, 
in this video description when it uploads to YouTube. All right, back to, uh, let's talk about vermitids for a minute. So here's a picture that I found on the web. It's funny, I don't even have vermitids listed under pests on my, my website right now because it's never really been a pest for me, but everyone hates them. So you've got this hardened shell right here, and then you've got this little port that's like a little door that opens and closes, and a, a worm will extend out just a hair and sends a web into the water whenever you put food. So you put food in the tank and suddenly this web appears. And if you watch, the food blowing around will land on the web, and then the worm will start consuming and reeling in the web to get the meal. And, you know, one or two vermitids is no big deal. But when you have hundreds, that's a big deal. And I've had some people have made basically, uh, recently mention how they had so many, they were frustrated, and they wanted to break down their tank. And I said, well, let's see the situation. They didn't have so many. They had a few dozen. That's not a big deal. I have seen tanks that are, I mean, there's a friend of mine uh, up in Colorado, I think, and he had a million of them. <laughs> it was thousands and thousands and thousands, and it was every single bit of his rock was covered with them. It was unbelievable. This guy had literally cornered the market on how to grow vermitids, and he hated them. And he says, what am I supposed to do? And I'd never seen anything like it. So occasionally you will have someone that has an overabundance of something, and it just proves that their food source was perfect for this animal to propagate itself. Now, the simplest solution to removing one of these is going to be to break off the tube, just snap it off, and then put a drop of glue over the hole, and that's it. You're done. And if you have 15 of these, I'm telling you, break off 15 tubes and put 15 dots of glue, and you're done. Because the worm can't come back out, and you'll just die inside the, the hole, and that's the end of it. But if you cannot get to it, you cannot reach it, at the very least, break off the tube as best you can with some kind of tool, whether it's chopsticks, tweezers, a screwdriver, you know, whatever. And then add a bunch of hermit crabs, little tiny ones. They will reach in and they will pull out the worm and eat it. So there is that choice, too. This picture you're seeing here was one that was in my tank. And, you know, I was kind of like, oh, you know, it's kind of a bother. I should probably deal with it. And I kind of ignored it. And then the coral, the surrounding tissue was getting a little bit pale. And that told me that the web was actually bothering the coral too much because the coral was no longer getting the nutrients it needed or was being too irritated or maybe it was even being slightly stung by the web. So I did end up uh, closing off the hole. And, you know, I'll find some of these growing in my refugium and I don't care. Or they're growing on the, the, the lock line returns where they're way up high and they can't touch anything. And I really don't mind. And, you know, so occasionally I get a good picture of them. But I, I don't really fear them. Let's see if there's any more pictures of them. So there's a better close-up. This coral is supposed to be green. They see how it was brown and tan. That's why I took the picture. It wasn't doing well. And here's another one where you can kind of see the tube is shaped. Let me zoom in on that for you. Let's see where it takes us. Oh, well. I was hoping it would make it bigger, but it is not. Let's see if we can do this. So you can kind of see oops, the whole torso of the tube in this case is wrapped around and around. And we'll bounce back out of there. Google images are great. If you, oh, what kind of glue? Super glue gel. That's all you need. You know, I have not been even trying this. Let's see. <laughs> I don't know if I would recommend sucking them out with a straw. <laughs> Let's skip that one. <laughs> all right, so we got that. Let's see if I jump back here. Um. A lot of these are going to be pictures from my system. Here's a couple of vermitids. Let's see where this goes. Where is this taking us? Oh my god, I'm already nervous. All right, that didn't work. Anyway, you can kind of see it. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. And a couple have taken uh, the... They've decided to grow a home on this, the shell of an astral snail. So look at that. It says copy rip. That is one of my pictures. <laughs> That's okay. I don't care. <clears throat> uh, all right. So I just want to talk about that one. Uh, if you cannot break them off, like I said, and you can't glue them shut, then you're going to have to worry about, you're going to have to use something else, some kind of an animal that will consume them. But if they can't reach down in the shell because of that little door that closes, you know, it's going to stay safe and it's going to keep doing its thing. So you're going to have to figure out a way to get to as many as you can. And it's not impossible. It's just something, it's going to be, you may have to take the rock out and turn it, 
break them off, glue them shut, and put the rock back in place. I mean, it's not like you cannot get in there and really get active with your tank if you must. But it's not something that you should ignore if it's going to grow out of hand. All right. Back to this. You guys want me to talk about Aptasia? <clears throat> Aptasia are pest and enemy. That's literally their name, pest and enemy. We're talking about pests. If you feel the need to uh, eradicate these, then there are a lot of different methods of doing it. And I, you know, I personally don't like the look either. There are solutions like peppermint shrimp that will eat them. There is Aptasia X or... Uh, that you can just apply right on there from Red Sea. There's also one from Blue Life you can use. Uh, in the old days, and I don't know if we can still get it, there's something called Joe's Juice. Some people just mix up Kalkwasser paste. You know, they actually make it very, very thick, so it's like a sludge, and they apply it with a syringe to just coat it. There's a lot of different, and then there's the laser video that I've shown you, and you can scrape them off with a dental tool if you take the rock out of the water, but you have to get rid of every trace of the tissue. It has to just be clean rock when you're done. The, the reason we don't like these little anemones is because they tend to sting corals that we do like, and they take up space in your tank. I'll show you here down below. You can see how they start taking over all the territory, and it can become really problematic to where you have tons of them. So I do recommend that you, know, you go in and handle it before they become many. Fish-wise, the file fish is one method. The copper band butterfly is another. But... Uh, I tend to do something that's more specific rather than relying on a fish. Because a fish may eat them. It may eat all of them, or it may eat some of them, and you still have some left over. And then you ask yourself, why won't they all go away? Why isn't that fish doing his job? Well, those fish don't read the same books we read, and they basically have a desire for something, or maybe they don't. Or maybe they're so spoiled by the amazing food that you offer, they don't care about Aptasia, because the food you're offering tastes so much better. So... Don't get too upset if you can't get rid of one uh, through the use of a fish. And do not fear using a chemical. That is one of the pet peeves. I, it drives me a little bit crazy when people say, I don't want to put chemicals in my tank. Because everything in your tank is a chemical. It all is chemical. The salt mix filled with chemicals. Every water change you do, chemicals. If I tell you to use Kenny Clean to get rid of cyanobacteria, don't fear it. Solve the problem. Move on with your life and be happy. Why be miserable for six months or eight months trying to do something the natural way when you can handle it in less than a week? Okay, that's the end of that rant. Um, this one here is an actual nudibranch that eats sun corals. <laughs> and I was really amazed at how beautiful it was to the point I wanted to go get it. It was a guy in Dallas had this thing. And I wanted to go there and get it just for pictures. That was so pretty. But uh, look at this. All these missing pictures. You know, it's funny. I test everything locally, and so it always works, I think, because things are in my cache. I'm going to have to go in here and find uh, what's missing on the website. But this nudibranch looked exactly like the sun corals it was consuming, and that's how the guy discovered it because the sun corals were closed, and he had a polyp that was crawling around his tank, and he was like, what is that? And that's when we found out there are tabastria eating nudibranchs out there. So again, this would be one you remove with the tweezer. And uh, we could talk about acar eating flatworms, or we could talk about montipore eating nudibranchs. Let's do the montipore eating nudibranchs, because that's a more important one. So in this picture right here, there is a nudibranch right there, and there is quite a few here, and there's a ton of babies in there as well. And in this picture here, there's a nudibranch, and here's one as well. So there's the parent, there's the mouth end, and, you know, kind of looks looks like eyes but are not. And then these are all babies, these tiny eggs. And what I want you to notice is here is healthy Montipora right here, and then here is dead Montipora. Whenever you are looking for Montipora eating nudibranchs, when you start seeing a part of your coral dying off, check that perimeter between life and death. And if you have Montipora eating nudibranchs, they're going to be right there, laying the eggs right on the edge of the life, the living food. The, the coral, so as the babies are born, they have something to go eat, and you definitely want to stop them. Here are some more of the adults, 
And I've got a ton more pictures of these things in one of my presentations, but these are a big deal. And there's no easy way to get rid of them other than to remove the coal from your tank, cut off the affected area, and throw it away, and save the living part and start fresh. If you don't do that, if you try to handle it, you will continue to have them forever. And there was a guy in my club not too, not too far away named Hank, and he had all kinds of monophora, and then he ended up having all kinds of monophora eating nudibranchs. And it was so bad that he had to just completely give up keeping monopora whatsoever in his tank. And it made him really sad. He was very disappointed that he couldn't keep these corals anymore, but these nudibranchs were beyond his control, and there was no in-tank treatment. You can do things like putting in a yellow coarse wrasse, and it may go in there and eat some of them as it finds them, because that's their, their job is to eat little nudibranchs. But the problem is, is again, as the fish gets bigger and fatter, it can't get into those nooks and crannies. So you have to have a really tiny one. It's got to be really hungry. And it's got to eat every last one. And if any survive, if any get through into the system and crawl around and, and lay eggs, you'll have a problem. I had a person actually leave a bucket of monophora by my front door. Like, here you go, Mark. And it was a long time ago. And I opened the front door and there's just this bucket of coral. <laughs> and I opened it up and it was filled with those. And I was like, okay, well, I have this quarantine frag system set up. I'll go ahead and I'll put them all in there. And I'll just kill the nudibranchs and then I'll put the corals in the tank. And I spent days or weeks trying to siphon out every last one I could. The craziest thing about these nudibranchs is when two of them were touching, you know, let's call it their, the tails or their butts were touching, it seemed like as soon as they touched, boom, there was eggs right there. It was crazy. And I could find two together. There was always babies right next to them all throughout that tank. And I kept siphoning and scraping and, and, uh, and tooth brushing and trying to remove, and I could not get ahead of it, and I finally just took all of it and threw it all away and said, forget it, it's just not worth the trouble. My friend Hank, by the way, years later, started growing monopora again, and I said, how did you do that? How did you finally solve the problem? He said, well, I didn't have new, I didn't have monopora for about two years, and finally I was fed up and I got a new piece, and they have just been growing ever since. I guess they died off and I never saw them again. So his solution was to wait forever until they completely obliterated themselves you know that but i'm saying if you see them it's best to just you know let's say let's say this is your coral right here give me a second and so here we go there's your living coral. Here are the enemies. Just save the living coral and start growing again. <laughs> and throw this part away. That's all I'm telling you. It's just the best way is just to move on. All right. And then this one here was a new one I hadn't heard about, and it was fascinating to me. I saw this on Reef to Reef, I believe. These are spiders that actually eat Acropora. And they're itty bitty tiny. That guy had a phenomenal picture of this thing. I mean, it was amazing. So, if you uh, are wondering why certain corals aren't doing well, the best thing you can do is to go into your tank late at night with a flashlight and just start studying everything. Look really, really closely. I think a lot of us miss a lot of fantastic stuff at night. One of the best things I can do when I go scuba diving is to scuba dive at night with a flashlight because that's when all the critters come out because all the fish are asleep and hiding. Fish don't roam all night. There's only a few nocturnal fish. Most of them go into little bedrooms and, and sleep for the night. Then they come out and they're active all day. And so all the neat critters are all hiding all day long. And then they come out at night and they forage all night long and look for food and they cause chaos. So be sure you're looking in your tank late at night with a flashlight. You know, grab a blue light, grab a red light. A red light's even better. If you have a red LED flashlight, you can study your whole tank because the livestock doesn't see the red spectrum, and so you can see everything. But if you uh, use a white flashlight, things may retract. They may hide. I have seen really cool stuff like peanut worms, which are not pests. They're really cool. And I've seen, you know, some of this stuff, you know. <laughs> so be aware of that. And uh, here is a normal type of flatworm called an Aeo aeolid. And they're, like I said, they're kind of an oval-shaped flatworm. And I remember someone sent me an email and said, 
where can I get more of these polka dotted mushrooms? <laughs> and I was like, those are not polka dots. Those are literally flatworms. You need to siphon them out. Now, these flatworms don't do harm, but they're hideous, especially when you see thousands of them in your tank. They literally just look, I mean, they're huge, like quarter of an inch to three-eighths inch long. They are not like sesame seeds at all. <clears throat> and when you see them all over the glass and all over the rock and all over the mushrooms and all over the corals and you know, all over your LPS corals, then it's no fun at all. And so you want to siphon them out. But you don't need to treat the tank with a chemical because they're so big and they're easy to identify. They're easy to spot. So all you got to do is just look for them. Now, what are they doing in the tank? They're actually eating the mucus off the coral, so they're kind of commensal. They, they're not enemies, they're not harming the tank, but they're just so ugly. And a, a friend of mine named Robert had a tank where he'd collect a lot of stuff from the Gulf, and you know, lots of urchins he had, and he had this tank just filled with these flatworms, like, what are you doing? He says, I know, I gotta deal with it. So if you ignore it too long, you'll end up with thousands. If you deal with it sooner, that would be better. And I want to talk about um, acropora-eating flatworms because it's a real problem. They are going to chew on your coral, and all these little white dots, those are bite marks. And all of them were just consuming my acropora from below. And then in this picture here, you can see how shiny they are. Now, the only way you can see them shiny is take the coral out of the water, let the coral kind of dry off, and go in the sunlight, and you'll see these glossy flatworms on the skin. Some people may not want to do that. Uh, and then right here in the center, the epicenter, that's actually a thousand little eggs. And so those eggs can go in there and consume things. Now, they actually have a name. Here is one that blends in perfectly with coral. Here are some egg casings. Here are some more egg casings. And here is their digestive system. A friend of mine has been researching these for some time now. And then I have an entire article about this, I hope. Why does nothing work today? Wow. I love finding all these errors on my website. You know, I spend so much time making sure everything works. Let's try this. I'm going to go through and I'm going to have to watch this video and find all the things that have errors today. Let's solve them. Okay, here we go. So this was a beautiful tricolor bolita. Tricolor bolitas are the candy of acrocor eating flatworms. They love this coral. So if you put this coral inside your aquarium and it doesn't do well, it's like your canary in the coal mine. This is your way, your indicator to know if there's a problem. So mine was getting consumed. There's more of the bite marks. It was getting pale. Here are some of the flatworms I pulled out. Here's one in relation to a tiny brittle starfish. Uh, there's actually lots of little tiny flatworms here. Here's a large adult and then lots of these little babies. And here are some of the eggs. And, you know, here is a thumbnail of a human being. And there are some of the eggs right there. So you can see there's a little tiny cluster. You have to remove every one of these eggs. You don't want any eggs at all in your tank. If you leave one egg behind, it's going to get into your system. So in this case, it would be better to cut the coral here and throw all this away. Some people, when they are buying new corals, they will cut off the frag plug. And they'll throw away the frag plug just to have the intact coral because they know the coral is clean. I mean, they are really, really small. These are in millimeters. And uh, I took this coral. What I did in my case, and let me, oh, okay. So we have a couple minutes here. <laughs> this coral was the one in distress. So I pulled it out and I treated it in a separate system first to see what would happen. And then I decided to do an in-tank treatment to solve the problem. And I was able to deal with acridin flatworms with a product called Interceptor. I'm sure my tank is incorrectly. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, the betadine dip I didn't like, because look what it does to the coral, completely turned it brown. It lost all color in the coral itself. And so I didn't like that. But I did like using Interceptor to kill it. But now we can't buy that stuff. It's not available on the market. So the alternate solution is actually pretty nice. You can use RODI water and a turkey baster, or you can use a maxi jet plugged into a long extension cord. So the turkey baster method is you turn up all the flow in the tank so the water is completely stagnant, and then you take your turkey baster, fill it up with RO water, and squirt it right on the affected coral, and the flat ones will just peel right off, and they'll, they'll, they'll actually drift into the water column. And then if you have fish like Antheus, they will gobble them up and consume them. 
which is awesome. And so I was doing that at first, but doing the turkey baster a squirt at a time was very tedious. So instead I grabbed a MaxiJet 1200, I plugged it into a long extension cord, I got up on my walk board, and I, or back then it was a step ladder because it was my 280 gallon reef. And I just pointed the power head at that coral and just shot that coral full blast, 300 gallons an hour, right into its core. And I would hold it in one spot for a long 20 second duration. And after 20 seconds, a flatworm would come flying off. And the Xanthias that was watching me work would dart out, gobble it up, and then go right back to her spot and wait for the next one. And it was great. We had this teamwork. And she, whenever she saw me with the power head, she went and sat on the one rock and waited. Very odd for an anthia. She was acting like a grouper, you know, and it was so cool. And so I would work my way, and I only attacked the specific coral that was affected. I didn't sit there and hit every coral in my tank. And I think that's where things go wrong for a lot of hobbyists, because they overreact. They want to go to the extreme rather than being balanced and find a happy place. So if you can turn around and... Focus on just the problem itself and not rip your reef to shreds. Your reef will survive the encounter. My friend Joe has a 20,000 gallon reef tank, right? Huge system, and he goes in there and occasionally has to deal with these things. And he goes in with a garden hose full of RO water, and he's squirting them all, and they all blow off. And then that's who gave me the idea, and that's how the fish all consume them. But what people were doing in the past, and maybe doing to this day, I don't know because I haven't seen it in a while, they would take every acropora out of their tank, and put in a new separate holding tank. They'd put good lighting on it. They'd put good flow on it. They would, you know, hook up all their gear to it. The problem was they were taking out every aquapore out of their tank, handling it, breaking it off of a colony, putting it in a temporary tank. Then they'd take it out and dip it every week to get rid of any kind of pests, and then put it back in the tank, and they're all stressed, and they're sliming. The, the lighting is different than they're used to. The flow is definitely different. Their neighbors are completely different. They're all stressed out constantly because they're constantly being dipped and they're blowing around and they're moving. And in the reef itself, they're taking a chisel or a scraper of some kind and they're chipping off every bit of aquapora life to remove the food that aquapora eating flatworms could consume. And it seemed like all the stories I read of people doing this were losing 80 to 90% of their aquapora trying to fight off this pest. Where... I didn't lose anything with my method of working in the tank, dealing with the one coral that was affected. And, you know, I had like one or two or three corals that seemed to be infested at one point. And you know what? That was a long time ago. I haven't seen acropora eating flatworms in my tank in 10 years or longer, probably 12. But back at the time, remember, it was a pain. I remember I didn't like it. You know, I was frustrated, you know, just like you would be. But I didn't rip my tank to shreds. I definitely didn't try to set up a temporary tank and transfer my livestock because that just sounded insane to me. And I, like I said, I think hobbyists take things to an extreme rather than trying to be reasonable and find a, a working solution. That's sort of like ripping all the carpet out of your house because there's fleas and then hosing it down outside and then bringing it back in. I mean, that, there's better ways to get rid of fleas, right? So be reasonable with what you're trying to do. All right. Now, I wanted to go into a different type of pest that you probably aren't thinking of, and that would be in the algae section. And, you know, cyano is not an algae, by the way. It's a bacteria, but it's here or there because everyone thinks red slime algae is what they call it. But I'm looking for something here called bryopsis. Now, bryopsis is a green, coarse plant that looks a lot like green hair algae. And bryopsis is very, like I said, it's coarse. It, it's got a turf to it. And what it does is as it grows out of your rock work, it will attract detritus not sand, but literally like fish poop, and it will capture it into its foundation and make its own little sand bed, so to speak. And it's feeding nutrients off of that detritus, and it makes the plants keep growing. And if you reach on the rock and you pinch it and you pull it off and you rinse it in a bowl of water and you come back, you're still leaving behind the very coarse turf, you know, the part you couldn't get with your fingertips. You can't really get with tweezers. It's just, it's really embedded. So... What people did a long time ago was they used something called Kent Tech M, which is a magnesium supplement. And that one product, whatever was in it, no one makes it like that, but <laughs> that product at the time was uh, the solution. And you raise your magnesium level to around 16 to 1800 ppm, and the brass will start to die off. Another method, if you can remove the rock or get the rock out of the water temporarily, is to put peroxide. The 3% peroxide you get for cuts. 
and just put that right on top of the plants. Let it sit for 10, 15 seconds, maybe dip it in some tank water and then put it back in your reef. And within about three days, the Briopsis will turn white and it'll just flake right off the rocks and die. Nowadays, we have a product called fluconazole, which is a, uh, a tablet that's used to kill fungus. And people are using that and they're dissolving it into their system and they put it in the water. They run no skimmer. I think it takes about three weeks and you can kill Briopsis. Uh, if you're, there was a guy that sent me pictures just recently where he's growing a bunch of parietes at the very top of his tank, right by the lock line. He actually glued it on or near the lock line because he liked the look, and now it's really, it's become this mass of coral. And it was all filled with Bryopsis. And he said, how do I get rid of this stuff? Nothing will go near it. The lettuce nudibranch is another creature that will eat it, and lettuce nudibranchs are beautiful. They, um, but they're very light. <laughs> they're very, you know, they're, they're just like fluffy. Let's see if I can find that really quick. Where do I put that? Uh, maybe it's in here. I'll show you the lettuce nudibranch because I thought it was gorgeous. It's weird how this thing is not pulling the screen the way I like it to. There we go. Where are you, lettuce nudibranch? Hiding somewhere else, apparently. There he is. Super pretty creature, but I would see this thing in my uh, tank one day, and then the next time I looked, it had blown off and was stuck to the side of a Tunzi pump. Or I found it down in the refugium, and I had to bring it back up to the tank and put it in place. And it's like putting cotton candy in place. It would just kind of like drift and kind of float away, and you're like pushing it back and waiting for it. But as soon as it touched surface, it would kind of like grab on. Very delicate looking. Um, very frail, but it's a great consumer of Bryopsis. Uh, but the fluconazole is what people like to use. Uh, peroxide is my choice and my weapon of choice. I think it's so much simpler and fast. But if I had a tank filled with it, I'd probably do fluconazole. And by the way, mentioning fluconazole, I heard a rumor. I don't know if it's true, but I mentioned the rumor to someone else who tried it himself. If you use triple the dose of that product, it should eradicate your bubble algae problem, balonia. So you can try that in your tank as well to remove bologna if you're so inclined. All right. Uh, I see a question here. Let's see if this works. It's supposed to click in. It's not doing it. Does this work? Okay, I'll do this. And we'll switch this to here. Why is it red? Are we talking about the app Reef Trace? Your data is very likely not deleted. What it is is it's dated, and you may have to click the compare button and then change the, the date, the timestamp of what you're looking for, and check the period, and then you'll find it. And you also have to select which item you're wanting to look at. I don't want this to be red. I don't remember how. Oh, here we go. It's going to keep doing red forever. We want it to be. Um, okay, I would like to answer some questions now. I feel like I've talked enough. There's plenty more to talk about. This could never end. But um, let's go ahead and pull that off. Uh, if my moderators have anything that I should have read by now, I would be happy to uh, address those now. And I'm going to scroll up and look. A lot of chatter from you guys today. Let's see. Uh, here's an older question that didn't get answered. How to get help with green hair algae? I have a video about that here on my channel that basically goes into three things. You're going to reach in your tank and you're going to pluck it off one pinch at a time, put in a bowl of water, rinse your fingers off, get them clean, put them back in the tank, and pinch some more, and do it over and over and over and over and over. That is the first part. The second part is to remove all the phosphate from the water, and I do that with Phosphate RX. And then the third part is to get a big, healthy cleanup crew. And I actually recommend one critter per gallon. 
And if you do those three things, hair algae in your tank will vanish. Next question. And I want to thank all of you guys for coming to the live stream each week. I really appreciate that. I've been hanging out in some other live streams recently. I've been on Reef Dudes. I was on Aaron's Aquarium last night. Uh, who else have I visited? Um, I've been on the uh, Neptune Systems live stream as well. And it's kind of fun to, to jump in there. And I see you guys on all of them. It's like you watch them all. It's, it's great. Oh, that's interesting. I don't know why this is the case. There's a popping sound each time someone tags me. I wonder how, I guess it's a sound effect from the, uh, the computer and the app is picking it up. I'm still scrolling. This is 100% true. And Ryan is my friend with the Thousand Gallon Reef, and he has lived through all of these horrible pests, and it really comes down to just a matter of picking a, picking a topic and researching a well and then pre, you know, building a presentation on that one item alone. You know, I only tackled maybe five or six things today. Uh, the Mahanos I did a video on, and I showed you guys how I just scraped them off. I literally took each rock out of my frag system, and I scraped off 100 Mahanos, and I put the rock in the tank, got the next rock up on my little workstation. And actually, I'm so happy with it. And I think right now I have maybe six Mahanos that have snuck in there. But guess what? I'm not going to let them turn into 1,000 again. That's not going to happen. Today is water test Saturday. I hope you are testing. I have been all over testing. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> so <clears throat> calcium reactors are one of my promised topics, and I've seen other YouTube channels are talking about them as well. I've been promising it for over a year. I've been really bad and really neglectful. But at the same time, I've been running one for so long that it's like no big deal to me. And I, for the most part, it is set it and forget it. There's little tiny nuances you may have to keep track of, but for the most part, very simple to work with. And for the last week, I have been trying to fine-tune mine back to where I like it. And this all developed because I switched pumps, and uh, then just the little things happen, and I was trying to resolve it. But in the meantime, I started doing some research. And I just did a blog about it, so it's a huge blog on my website. Uh, right now, if you go to blogs, <clears throat> and we'll switch this screen real quick to that. Okay. And then right here is Alkalinity Matters, is my latest blog. And I was spending time on this today because I wanted to go into some questions I had and then the answers I came up with. And so that is for you guys to read later if you like. But the bottom line is the output of your calcium reactor or the output of your dosing pumps is going to be adding the alkalinity to your tank as frequently as you run it. With a calcium reactor, it's 24 hours a day. With a dosing pump, you may have it doing it 12 times a day. You may have it doing it 24 times a day. You might have it doing it once a day. But what is coming out? Do you ever measure that? Besides measuring how much, do you measure the strength of it? I was very curious how much DKH was in a batch of mixed up soda ash. So you take two cups of that and you mix it with a gallon of RO DI water and stir it up and it turns clear and then you dose that. How strong is that? And so I took my little magnetic stirrer out. I put in my five milliliters of, of alkalinity. And then I started testing. And I used, I, this is a brand new kit. And I almost completely drained the bottle and still couldn't get a color change. So smarter people than myself said, you know, Mark, you could dilute that and then do the test and then multiply times 10. And Yes, that sounds like even more math, and I'm probably going to do it. But as far as I can tell, the solution measured higher than 180 dKH. That's really, really, really potent stuff. 
The calcium reactor, on the other hand, typically our effluent, the liquid coming out of the reactor, should measure between 19 and 35. Well, I've been tweaking my system because I was trying to solve a low DKH problem in my reef, and my number as of two days ago coming out of the reactor was 70, which is really high, and I really melted my media significantly. And this, is, this will make a lot more sense when I actually do this video, but I'm just kind of giving you a preview. You know, this stuff doesn't just happen naturally. You have to live through it and experiment and, and investigate and, and use up test kits, but it is really nice to know stuff. And so I was asking, and I have done it on this channel, on the YouTube channel, in the community tab, I asked everyone, could you please tell me what dosing pumps you're using these days? And then I also asked in Club Milo's Reef, and this is the link to get there. I also asked the same thread in there, and I already had 100 replies over in Club Milo's Reef of what dosing pumps people are using now to dose their system, because I know calcium reactors are not in vogue. They were very popular 10, 15 years ago. And there are lots of people that still use them to this day, but it's usually for big tanks. And for people with small tanks, it made sense to dose two, two part. What's amazing me is that there are people with huge tanks that are dosing two part, or let's call it three part. And they're dosing alkalinity and calcium and magnesium, and they're mixing up a five gallon bucket, I guess every month. And then they have to make sure their dosing pump never fails. And they have to make sure that the tubing doesn't clog, you know, where the water's coming out, or the solution is coming out, the chemical. See, chemicals in your reef. So uh, I wanted to point those out to you guys because that's going to be part of my calcium reactor video. And I wanted to know what you're using and how much you spent because that's a big part of it. People typically say, oh, calcium reactors are so expensive or they're so complicated. Well, it should be interesting to see what I come up with. I, you may discover that a calcium reactor is in your near future and you might want to join me in all the fun. And typically, it is fun. It, it usually is no big deal. I ran into a little thing this week. I'm not even a bit surprised, and uh, I, I just had to find the solution. My tank was staying at 7.5 dKH. I could not get it to come up. I could not understand why. And my uh, originally, I noticed that I was reading the display wrong. I, I just looking at it, I'm like, well, that looks right. <laughs> it was wrong. It was completely wrong. But in my brain, I was like, oh, that's fine. And I never put two and two together. And it took me a while to say, oh, no, that's not the number. It's supposed to be 6.5 on the display. That explains why my tank is staying at 7.5. So I adjusted it, and the tank didn't budge. I thought, well, that's weird. And so I investigated the tubing leading to the calcium reactor, and there was a little bit of salt. I think, okay, and I cleaned it off. And again, no solution, still 7.5. So then I took the check valve apart. There used to be on the side of my calcium reactor was a bubble counter. And basically it's a, bit, a solution, whether it's water or salt water or even um, mineral oil, that you can watch the bubbles go up like a lava lamp very slowly through it. Well, a long time ago, I had used too much pressure on my calcium reactor, and I basically crazed the, the bubble counter. It was just clear acrylic that just had a billion cracks. It looked like a spider web of cracks. It was done. And I discovered that I could actually remove that piece and just take the top and the bottom and screw them together and keep using my calcium reactor because I could not get the replacement part. At the time when I contacted Life Reef and said, I need a new one because I ruined it, he said, I only make those once a year. That's going to be in six months from now. And I was like, well, I can't wait six months. What can I do now? So I went ahead and I just put the two together. Well, the top piece of those two parts is a check valve inside there. And my check valve had sealed tight inside there. And I took it apart. I cleaned it with water. I put silicone grease on the O-ring. And now it's working perfectly again. And then I set the thing, and I thought, I'm done. And the next day, my tank is still 7.5. I'm like, what is going on? So the next step, process of elimination, is like, well, what is the pH in the reactor? Because the controller says it's 6.5, but what's the truth? So I captured what's called the effluent, the liquid coming out. And it was measuring, um, I think it was measuring, I have notes somewhere, but I can't remember. I think it was like 7.1 or, or 6.9, which is not 6.5. And I thought, okay, that pH probe on the reactor is really old. It's probably defective. So for the time being, the solution will be to tell my controller to go lower than my set point to actually get the point I'm trying to get. So it's sort of like using a bad 
uh, refractometer, like you, you know you want your selenium to be 1.026, but you know that the thing is reading high. So you intentionally go to a lower number just to get by until you can get the new one replaced, right? That's what I was doing. So if my controller is to 6.5 and I'm not getting 6.5, I'll go to a lower number to get 6.5 is the point. And that blog kind of explains it. <laughs> You're probably thinking, what is he talking about? But it's the truth. And so I waited overnight and I measured the tank and the DKH went up. And I looked at the calcium reactor and it's supposed to be all this beautiful media, nice and clean because I just cleaned it out and put it, refilled it. And the water was supposed to be clear and my water was gray. It was kind of murky. I'm like, oh, I've melted it too much. So I measured again and my uh, pH inside the reactor measured 6.12 but the pH controller said it was uh, set to 5.8. <laughs> so I bumped it back up. Now I'm back up to like 5.9 right now. And I also changed the drip rate to a really slow drip. And I checked my tank today and it was 10.5. So my alkaline is definitely high, higher than I wanted. I want it to be around 10. But the bottom line is, is that I stayed on top of all this before I watched corals die in my tank. And that is the bottom line with anything we do with our reef keeping is that we want to look at what's going on, figure out what's not working right, fix it now before the livestock even knows, and that way your reef never skips a beat. And that's what I've been working on for the last few days between filling orders and answering your questions online. Now, did anyone um, <laughs> just say I'm out of here and just <laughs> leave the stream because that was way too much information? scrolling through. Um, I, I didn't really mention this, but I should have, and that is you always want to dip any new coral arrivals that avoids dealing with the uh, pests in the first place. If you see any kind of pests in your tank after you've dipped, well, that just is you know, unlucky. But dipping is the best first defense against getting any kind of pests in your aquarium. And one of the things that I used to do with flatworm exit, because we had so many flatworms in our area, every fish store I went to had the red planaria in their tanks. And I actually told the store owners, you have got to solve this because every coral you sell goes to a person to infest their tank with these flatworms. And then people are trading corals with each other, and you are just adding to the problem. And they said, yeah, we know, we're trying. I was like, well, I mean, really, that's the number one thing. And the fisher by my place, Frank's Tanks, he dips everything that comes in in solution. And, you know, in the old days, he used, you know, whatever was on the market. Now he's, he really likes Bayer Interceptor. The Interceptor product is something you buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. But... When you mix it with water, it looks like milk, and you can't even see what you've dipped, but it kills everything. The downside is it also kills the good stuff, like commensal crabs you would want. And so it's kind of a bummer when he sits there and he kills everything on an Acropora because he's killing some of the things we want, like the little bandit crabs that live in there and keep the algae healthy and defend it from algae and keep things away from it. That's a good crab, but you can't really buy those. They're very hard to come by. So typically, we would, in the old days, we would buy a coral colony with that crab intentionally to put in our tank because they are perfect for each other. And with the fisher by me, he is literally killing off anything to make sure there's no pests, but he's also reducing some of the things we do want, which is kind of a bummer. Okay, here's someone talking about hydroids. Hydroids are definitely a pest that we want to avoid. They tend to be small tubes that are soft, and they have what looks like a little, uh, like, eight-armed feather duster-looking thing at the tip. And they grow in hundreds at a time, but you should be able to scrape off the entire patch. Another method that people have used in the past to get rid of hydroids would be to cover them with something. Uh, caulk, wasser paste was one method. Others actually took putty and put putty right over the patch and just smothered them. Um, uh, you could probably put glue on them as well. 
but really trimming, snipping, and hermit crabs are going to be a good defense because hermit crabs go everywhere and pick at everything. And we're going to need to wrap this up because we are getting past the hour. Let's see. There is a hydroid jellyfish that I've had in my tank in the past that was not bad and actually kind of beautiful. Let's see if I can figure out where I put it. Um, give me a second to look it up for you guys. I think I saw it here. Yeah, okay, so jump to here really quick. And this guy right here is a beautiful picture of a hydroid jellyfish. Turn this off. So look at that. That thing is awesome. That is so hard to take a picture of because that thing is maybe two pinheads in size. And they will appear in your tank briefly. Like if you set up a brand new tank and you use a bag of live sand, within the first week or two you may see hundreds of these on the glass. And you're like, oh, that's amazing. They're neat. What the hell are they? I'm scared. And then they're gone. And they're just... They have evaporated, and I think what happens is they don't find the food source they need to keep living. But I have enjoyed seeing them every time I've set up a new tank, and I will, I, I would have a refugium just filled with them, right? You know, this the area in the front of my refugium because I put live sand in the tank, and so they got down in the refugium and they just filled that area. And I would take the uh, cleaning magnet and just kind of swipe the glass, and they'd all go flying off. And within 15, 20 seconds, I look at where I just cleaned, and they were right back on there again. They're super fast at getting back on, onto the wall. These are not the kind that drift around and pulse in the water. They actually want to adhere to a solid surface. So they are not one I would fear. I would not tell you to avoid it or, or to panic about it. They're totally fine. Uh, here's a question that we can definitely address. Does cyano disappear at night? I have some maroon stuff that grows during the day but almost completely disappears at night. That is exactly how cyano works. Cyanobacteria is photosynthetic, which means the light in your tank is feeding it and fueling it and making it grow. And then at night, it pretty much looks like it's gone. And then the next day, it's back again. And so by treating your tank to kill this stuff off entirely, you will solve the problem. And there are, you're always going to hear, people are always going to say this, find the source of it and solve it, increase the flow, I get all that, that's fine. Bottom line is, kill the cyanobacteria. Cyanobacteria actually is totally normal, it exists in freshwater, brackish water, and salt water, it's everywhere. And I recently shared a video on my Miller's Reef page on Facebook, where they found it like crazy deep in the strata, you know, that's super ancient old and it was still alive down there, so I mean... You're never going to get away from it. We just don't like it when it's red, when it appears in our tank. That's when we don't like it. When it's invisible, we don't even care. And it's completely normal. So when it's red, when it's blooming, that's what we call the red slime if we say it's in bloom, then you can siphon out the majority of it. Just make, you know, turn off the pumps, scrape it all into a pile, siphon it out, turn the pumps back on, then treat with ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX, which is the one I sell. Your skimmer has to be off, not bubbling with a cup off. Just turn off the skimmer. Go clean your skimmer for three days. Turn off your carbon. <clears throat> Add an air stone to the tank if you feel like you don't have enough oxygen. And in three days, if it's gone, great. If it's not, put in the product again and wait two more days. When it's gone, do a big water change, which is at least 25% of your water. <clears throat> turn your skimmer back on and turn on a fresh reactor full of carbon, which is a half a cup per 50 gallons. And as your collection cup on the skimmer keeps filling up, just dump it out and put it back on and dump it out. And I don't care if you have to dump it out 40 times in six hours. Just dump it out, dump it out, dump it out, dump it out, dump it out. And then go ahead and put new salt water in the sump to replace all the water that's coming out of the skimmer. So if you're not able to babysit it to that degree, if you cannot sit there and add more salt water as you're dumping out collection cups of skimmate, which is just basically watery medicine, then you can set up your top-off system to add salt water to the tank instead of fresh water, just for this session, just for the 6 or 12 hours, and that will replenish the water. But I mean, basically, what I would do is <clears throat> I let my skimmer dump out the water, and I would dump it into a bucket, and I'd go get on my computer, and then I'd go check on 10 minutes, and the cup was full, and I'd dump it into a bucket. And when my bucket had about this much water, I took another bucket with this much water and poured it back in the sump just to replenish my salt water. 
I just didn't even use my top off system. I disabled it. But you could use a top off system to replenish salt water to replace every drop you're throwing away rapidly until things are back to normal and the skimmer's operating normally, and then switch back to regular RODI water for top off. And that is how you get rid of cyano in three to five days and not suffer through it for weeks and weeks and weeks. <clears throat> Ah, okay. I didn't go into dinoflagellates today, and one of the reasons I did not is because I don't really have a solution for you guys. And what really drives me crazy is that it seems like everyone is suffering with so much dinoflagellates these days. I don't understand it. It seems to be everyone is running with these low-nutrient tanks. I mean, they're starting off with dry sand and dry rock, so there's no beneficial bacteria. Then they add shrimp, or they add Dr. Tim's, or they add uh, Turbo Start, or you know, whatever they add, you know, ATM's, uh, I think it's called Turbo also. They put the stuff in there, and that gets you some bacteria, but it's not the beneficial system of setting up a tank with live sand and live rock, like I've always done. And I think because nitrate and phosphate are so low in these brand new systems, it's almost leading you right into the preface, pre what am I trying to say? Precipice. <laughs> you know, the edge of the cliff to where you're just going to drop them into dinoflagellate land. And that is a real shame. And it's a horrible thing to have to deal with in your tank. <sighs> Siphoning it out is the first approach. Not adding more water to the system is a way to not fuel it. Raising the pH and keeping it at 8.5, which is hard to do but helps to defeat it. These are all ways to get rid of dinoflagellates. Fauna Marin makes a product called Dino X, which you can use that will remove uh, it slowly over time, but it takes again three or four weeks to kill the stuff off. I have had hints of it appear in my tank in the past, and hints of it down in the refugium. I'd see this weird kind of bubbly slime growing on the surface of my plants or up to the top of the water, and I took a ladle and I just push it down into the water, and the, the slime would shoop into the spoon, and I'd dump it into a nearby bucket, and I'd just shoop, dump, dump, dump until I got rid of all that slime off the surface. And that was good enough. I had one coral I brought home from Florida. It was a gorgonian, a big tall purple one. And it was covered in dinos. You saw this, these black stringy brown webs coming off of it. And it was obviously dinoflagellates. And I took the coral in my hand, put it in a bucket of salt water, and swished it around and around and around. And it looked like a tornado of brown strings. And I took the, the coral and put it back in my tank. And the next day it was covered with them again. So the next day, I put it in the bucket and I swirled it around. I said, this is no way this coral is going to survive if I keep doing this. I cannot keep manhandling this coral, but I definitely don't want the stuff in my tank. And I did it like two or three times. And then I went ahead and I used hydrogen peroxide, which is one milliliter per 10 gallons of water in your system for eight days in a row. And that nipped it in the bud because I didn't let it get big. But if you have something that's spreading out and you're like, I don't even know if it's cyano or if it's dinos or if it's diatoms and it just seems to be everywhere. And especially when it gets to the point where it's a massive density of it, that's when the, the battle becomes so much bigger. And you have to really suffer the consequences. And what people will do is they will like completely encase their tank in cardboard and they turn up all the lights and they leave it in total darkness for five days in a row. Problem is, if you have corals in there, you're going to lose the corals, and because you know, they they can't survive such a long duration with no light. I've never had to go that route, and like I said, I don't have the solution for you guys. I wish someone would just invent the product, and I could tell everyone just use this, just use this, and you're good. Because I would tell every single person to buy it, and I would hope you would, and and just solve the problem once and for all. But basically, don't have low nitrate, don't have low phosphate. You know, have a little bit of each rather than trying to hit zero. And uh, if you're not getting enough, you can actually buy nitrate and phosphate to pour in your tank, or you can add more fish and you can feed more heavily. Uh, it could be also it's the time period of how old your tank is. It's just too immature for the amount of livestock, the amount of food you're using, and it, it's just creating this problem. I, I wish I had a better answer for you guys. But it's Dinoflagellates are horrible. There's articles about it. There's a massive article by Randy Holmes Farley that you can read. And uh, I will have to put a link to that. Randy. Let's see if I can pull this up really quick. 
Um, so this is the article I want you guys to read. It's old and it's very in-depth. And he shows some pictures of some really bad dinos here. So this one here, he talked about raising pH and some of the methods of using to fight stuff. But that is definitely an important one that you want to go to. And uh, it's just one tool. Like I said, there's big threads about it on Reef to Reef where they go into it. And the problem is the threads are so long. When a thread becomes 50, 70, 120 pages long, I want someone to condense it down into a single article that you can read. Because there's going to be a lot of chatter in there. There's going to be a lot of banter. There's going to be a lot of, well, what about this? And then people say, well, it was answered already on page 31. <laughs> and it becomes really repetitive. So if someone can just streamline that thread into an article to help the most people, that would be ideal. Else do we got here? Okay, let's do this one. When you treat green hair algae with hydrogen peroxide, is it okay to add your tank water or does it only work in spot treatments like you showed in your video? The best way to use peroxide with that application is to take the rock out, like go over your sink, and drip it right on the algae itself. The reason I did that is because that rock usually has corals on it, too, and I'm not trying to get peroxide on the corals. I'm trying to treat just the algae, and I'm holding the rock in the exact orientation to where if it's dripping, it's dripping down in the sink, and it's not dripping toward the coral. The problem is if you take that rock now and put it right back in your tank, the f <laughs> I've seen this happen. All the snails in my tank immediately go up all the walls to the top. They, they're, like, trying to escape. It's, it's hilarious. And so I have decided since then... I will then dip the entire rock in a bucket of salt water and then put it in my tank where the snails are, and I don't see the snails respond the same way. So too much peroxide in the tank can definitely affect what's going on in the water. All right, guys. Um... I think we're here at the end of this stream. Wow, we've been going almost an hour and a half. I would like to wrap this up with some of the important things. Uh, number one, I would love it if you would join Club Mila's Reef because we have a great growing community. The people in there are super helpful. We have multiple moderators that are just like they're helping here on the YouTube channel today. They are helping keep the group safe and friendly. We have all different ages in the group. We have very young kids all the way up to, you know, retired individuals. We have people with very little experience all the way up to people with lots of experience. We want the ones with lots of experience to help those that have very little experience, of course, to avoid the pitfalls of what can go wrong in the hobby. And one of the concerns that we always have, we being those of us with experience, is watching new people giving advice to new people. It's not that you're necessarily wrong, but you might be. And, or you might be basically regurgitating something you've heard somewhere else, not something you've lived through and done. So we want to make sure that we're giving good, solid information. Definitely back it with an article or a link to something that shows how it works successfully. We want to make sure that, you know, everyone is getting helped in a good way. And we want the group to stay friendly. And so we are totally on top of that. We're watching very closely for anyone that could try to cause chaos and those people will be removed from the group immediately. They will never be back in. If you're in the group and you're having a bad day, don't go to the group. <laughs> because it's a, let's call it zero tolerance, which I kind of hate to say. But basically, be kind or be banned is the only rule of the group. And so if you decide to be mean to other people, you'll get thrown out and you'll never get back in. You won't be able to say, hey, I'm sorry, or, or this happened. It's like, just don't even go to the group because you're having a bad day. Go watch TV, go play with your tank, you know, go for a walk, take a run. Whatever it is you got to do, but we're not your punching bag, and we are going to continue to keep it a friendly place. Uh, I am going to throw this out there because I'm seeing more of it. We're all adults. I told you there's some kids in there, but, I mean, we're mostly adults, and we do use off-color language. I'm noticing more and more of that in the group. I'm not really a huge fan of that, and I'm just going to ask you guys to kind of self-regulate yourselves a little bit in that regard just because it's just nicer. Uh, it's not necessary. 
to uh, drop F-bombs left and right. Sometimes it's totally appropriate. Most of the time it's not. <laughs> and in some parts of the world it's totally acceptable, or in others it's not. So that's also part of the dichotomy of what works. But uh, the group has been doing really well. We're coming up close to 3,000 members. And here is the link to get you there. It's really easy. Facebook.com slash group slash Mila's Reef. Also, if you just go to Facebook.com slash Mila's Reef, that is the page where I share a lot of stuff. Uh, a lot of my Instagram goes into my Mila's Reef page automatically. Uh, I share all kinds of neat things I find on Facebook to the Mila's Reef page. So be sure you do that. The group is for conversations. The page is more for like, this is neat. I found this. So I want to invite you guys to that. And uh, finally, I do want to hopefully ask you to go to my website to buy things because whatever you buy helps feed the dentist. <laughs> and that is going to, I'm going to keep talking about this until he's done charging me. Uh, but I get to get the uh, measurement for the new tooth on November 19th. So I'm hoping to have it installed before uh, Christmas. So happy Christmas to me. I get to chew on something. That'd be nice. But yeah, if you can buy anything from the website, I really appreciate it. If it's something that I have to build, there will be some time for me to build it. If it's something I can just drop into a box, I'll ship it. If it's something I need to replenish, because a lot of you have been buying things. Thank you. And you see, that's, that's my favorite part of this whole situation. I did not do a GoFundMe and say, just send me money. I said, buy things you need anyway, and let me use some of that profit to pay bills I got to pay. And so I appreciate the business that you're giving me and that you're allowing me to provide you with the items that you need. So thank you for that. I want you guys to please test your water today. Get out your test kits. They're only good for a year. They're designed to be used 52 times a year or 50 times. Basically, you have one year's worth out of that test kit. You want to measure alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, salinity, temperature, uh, phosphate, nitrate. Those are kind of the big ones. If you aren't doing it already, be sure that you are logging them in Reef Trace. That app just had another update rollout this week. It is ex uh, in existence for iOS as well as for Android. Uh, there are some really cool things coming to that app in the next, uh, I made some special requests this week. I said, I really want this. And I told the developers that, and so they're working on it now. And I think it'll be out in time for Thanksgiving. So that will be a really cool effect. I um, really enjoy using the app and seeing the results you guys are posting. We actually, it's all being, uh, it's all saved in the cloud. And then I can ask them for information and say, hey, so how's it going here? And how many people are doing this? And it's very interesting. And, you know, I'm hoping that more of that type of, <clears throat> I can't think of the word, conglomeration of that amassing of details. I'm hoping some kind of results will be shared at some point, you know, something that says, you know, 80% of people use ELO's test kit, for example. You know, I don't know. Just something, I think those kind of details are kind of cool to know. Just like everyone wants to know, well, what's the best such and such? You know, like, how about this one? Everyone says, what's the best salt? And that's a great debate, right? Everyone debates it to death. So, no, it's just, it's interesting to see what's going on in the real world with real users entering their own data and seeing how you're doing with your tanks. So... You do your water test, you share your results today, either on Instagram, hashtag water testing, hashtag post your results, or you can do it on Club Mila's Reef, and you can share them in there. Uh, I have to do my tests as soon as I'm done with the stream, then i got to build a sump for a customer. So I've got that to do today. I actually saw the sun came out today, first time in days. It has been raining nonstop here. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas. And I hope the ground will dry out enough today and possibly tonight that I can mow tomorrow. I think this is the final mow of the year. But I hope so. I really don't want to mow when it's freezing cold out. <laughs> but my yard looks like a mess, but it's been such a flood. I just can't do anything right now. Uh, this is a cool question. Can we put a giant Wikipedia for reef keeping? You know, it's not a bad idea. And I would like to say there are certain websites that pretty much do that now. Uh, obviously, well... Maybe not so obvious. But you know how you can ask anything in Google. You can say, I, I'm trying to solve this, and you just type in the question, and Google spits up all these answers. That is your first line of attack, usually, when it comes to questions. I share a ton of information on my website, and so I always type in my question. I add the word Milev to the end, and then it takes me to anything I've written about it anywhere on the web, 
And that's how I get my answers that I can share with you guys when you need an answer because I've talked about it in the past. The other thing, there's like websites like reefs.com. There's reefkeeping.com. These are all articles that you can dig through and you can research and get some really good solid articles from some experts. And I do recommend that. It seems really hard to have a single source that everyone says is believable. You know, there was a website specifically just for the care of zoanthids. And it just became a, a zoanthid ID website instead just for names so people could figure out how much to charge to sell the ones they had. So it kind of missed the boat in my opinion in that regard. There's another one I think called seaslugs.net and it just deals with only every kind of nudibranch and, and snail and, and gastropod that's in the ocean. And I mean, there, there seems to be these sources, but the one place that fits everything, it's kind of Google, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> All right, guys, thank you so much for your attention. I am going to log off now. This was a super long live stream. Thank you for your help, moderators. And if I didn't get your questions answered today, I'm going to try and go through this afterwards and see what I can answer on Facebook because there will be a video tonight that uploads to Facebook somewhere around 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And that's where I answer the questions. I'm quick to the point. Uh, the video is usually 8 to 11 minutes long, and it's going to be on Facebook.com slash Reef. So if you've missed some of those videos, check them out. They're all on there. I've been doing them for the last three or four weeks in a row. And there's another one coming tonight. That's it. I'll talk to you guys really soon.